This is your host, Sapin Bhartia, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Bilbao, Spain. And today we have with us Hart Montgomery, CEO of the Hyperledger Foundation. Hart, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me. Where are we now when it comes to some of these technologies? There was a point, there was a light of hype cycle, and then hype cycle faded in, which is good in most cases because some of these technologies have become part of some critical infrastructure, you know, industries. So I want to just, you know, give us an overview of not only the foundation, but these uh, blockchain technologies. You bring up a great point on the hype cycles. We've had sort of three cryptocurrency boom and bust periods, you know, uh, 2013, you know, 2018, 2019, and, you know, now we're sort of, you know, back in a down cycle. Uh, but for us at Hyperledger, we're agnostic to the token price, right? You know, we build blockchain software that companies use for various production activities, almost all of which are not connected to uh, tokens or token value uh, in the cryptocurrency sense. Um, so, you know, the hype cycle doesn't really affect us as much as it may other people in the blockchain space uh, because we are just focused on applications and, and technology. Um, you know, that being said, the space has evolved a ton, uh, even, uh, you know, in the last, uh, I don't know how many years, um, I would say enterprise blockchain really got started off, you know, in 2014, 2015. Um, and it's been really interesting to see, you know, enterprises uh, embrace and adopt the technology. What are the industries which are embracing it? Where it, you can already see, hey, you know what? This is where it has found a very strong foothold. So I like to think of, blockchain or dis uh, distributed ledger as a, a tool that solves the following problem. So if you want to have a distributed database with decentralized trust, then you need a blockchain and a distributed ledger. ledger. If you think about public blockchains, right, you know, Bitcoin is really just, a, you know, um, a decentralized database for, you know, some kind of money, right, with distributed trust. Ethereum is a decentralized database for, you know, really programs. Uh, with decentralized trust. So anytime you have this need for decentralized trust, you know, it's a great opportunity to use a distributed ledger. And we see things like, you know, complicated supply chains, right? Um, where if you want to track materials, uh, say if you're a car manufacturer, right? Or if you're a, a food processor, or a restaurant or a, you know, a grocery store, right? You might have a very complicated supply chain, right? You might have competitors on your supply chain, right? Uh, and it might not be the case where one company can be the sole root of truth for the whole supply chain. Uh, so in this case, you know, decentralization is great. Um, so, you know, supply chain is, is obviously one of the core applications. Uh, we've seen a huge interest recently in finance, right? Again, um, you want to have a system of record. You want to know who owns what. You want to have you know records of deals. And certainly, if you're a financial institution, you may not trust completely other financial institutions to be the sole guarantors of those records, right? So we've seen a lot of interest in, in blockchain for that too. And now, you know, CBDCs. Uh, everyone's talking about central bank digital currencies uh, and how blockchain can potentially help central bank digital currencies scale. I don't want you to take any names. It's about your own comfortable, but uh, some concrete use cases deployment where you're like, hey, well, this bank or this financial institute or this healthcare provider, they are leveraging these uh, open source uh, hyperledger technologies. Sure. Walmart, for instance, with the food trust program uh, uses hyperledger fabric for a supply chain network to track all of their, I think a large, uh, a large amount of produce. Uh, and it's led to some really nice results. Whereas before using blockchain, it could have taken them days or even up to a week to track uh, sort of the origin of produce. Now it's just a matter of seconds. Uh, and this is really nice in the case of something like a recall, right? Uh, if you had to recall, you know, some vegetable or some produce, right? Uh, in the past, you would have to, you know, literally throw everything out because you couldn't efficiently track where things came from, right? Now, uh, with blockchain, you can immediately know what the contamination or what the contaminated produce is, and you can only throw out that produce. And it's a huge amount of, of savings uh, because you don't have to waste a bunch of stuff. Um, 
you know, another supply chain example is uh, the GSBN, uh, which is a shipping network. Uh, and I believe it's something like more than a third of all shipping containers that travel across an ocean are, are tracked on the GSBN. And again, it's a big decentralized network with a lot of shipping companies, and it allows people to track and trace and, and see where things are. And the GSBN also does, you know, it does a bunch of other things as well um, with respect to uh, trade finance. Uh, but, you know, we could do an entire presentation on that. Um, you know, for CBDCs, um, I think it's really interesting to see how those are catching on. You know, we've had a couple of uh, countries and, and organizations start, uh, you know, with real production CBDCs, uh, like the eNaira, for instance, of Nigeria. Um, and we've seen more and more countries, you know, test out uh, CBDC using uh, Hyperledger technology. We actually have a case study that you can find on our website and you can see all of the different countries that have experimented or you know, done a POC or, or even put into production uh, a CBDC with a particular blockchain platform. What kind of interest or option for a Hyperledger or uh, the blockchain technologies you have seen from the public sector, which could be the federal level, the state level, even the local government. And we are here in Europe. Europe, you know, Europe is much more sensitive towards those topics. So can you talk about that? I had a panel discussion yesterday uh, on this. And, you know, we had uh, Jesus from Alastria who gave a you know great explanation of all of the public chain uh, applications and what Europe was doing with uh, EBC or even what uh, Spain was doing. Uh, but we have a number of uh, I would call them public permissioned blockchains. So anyone can join, uh, but you know governments or, or agencies are, are operating the blockchain nodes. Uh, so perhaps the most well-known of these at this point is something called LACchain. Uh, it was started uh, by an initiative of the IADB, which is a you know a huge bank uh, and a number of countries in the region, uh, and it serves as a you know a a blockchain where anyone from these com countries or, or companies there uh, can use it for their business needs. Um, so we've seen a huge, huge uptick uh, in public interest in use over the past couple of years. One more thing that I want to talk to you about, if you look at the Linux Foundation in Europe, they came up with some projects like Wallet and all those things. What kind of involvement you see or scope you see of Hyperledger there? Well, Hyperledger is, you know, very closely aligned with Open Wallet. You know, I've served as a technical advisor to Open Wallet. Um, because, well, obviously, you know, blockchain, how are you going to interact with a blockchain, right? You know, a wallet is a great tool for that. Um, so, you know, we obviously work with Open Wallet quite a bit, um, both on an application side and on a, uh, a developer side. I sort of think of both as applied cryptography projects. Um, and we've actually started a, a digital trust initiative to help people coming to the Linux Foundation looking for uh, digital trust projects and, and things in digital trust to sort of be able to find what they're looking for. Talk a bit about some of the just the progress, you know, just give us an update on the Hyperledger, you know. So the Hyperledger Foundation has a number of different projects. Um, we have our core ledgers, which are Fabric, Besu, Aroha, Sawtooth, and technically India's a ledger, uh, and development on those continues to move forward. Um, you know, Fabric is still the most popular blockchain platform for enterprise. Uh, Besu continues to grow substantially and it's gotten a ton of interest for CBDCs uh, and from financial institutions. Where we've seen a lot of growth is in projects that make blockchain easier to use uh, or with interoperation and, and interoperability. Um, so, you know, we expect to see sort of a world of, of many different blockchain networks. There's not going to be one blockchain sort of to rule them all. Even, you know, public blockchain enthusiasts, you know, realize this and see this. You know, you see the proliferation of L2s on Ethereum, for instance. Um, so we have tools like Cacti, which is a software focused on cross-chain transactions, atomic swaps, and blockchain interoperability. Uh, we have Firefly, uh, which is 
I like to think of it as sort of a blockchain, blockchain container or blockchain middleware that allows you to write code once and run it on a number of different blockchains in a very interoperable way. Uh, and we also have some digital identity projects um, like Hyperledger Ares. Uh, and, you know, I certainly think that digital identity is going to take over everything, right? Every, all, um, all identity is going to have a digital component or be digitized. And so I think that's, you know, really exciting, particularly when these folks are, are working with selective disclosure and other techniques that allow you to do identity in a very, very privacy preserving way. When we do talk about digital identity, when we look at the the world there, how do you see that the role of Hyperledger projects can play there or you're already in talks where you're like, no, we are going to play a big role there? Well, we already do. Um, I mean, Aries is a huge community, has a huge number of maintainers and has a lot of real world production projects already. Um, you know, you can look at what the government of British Columbia has done with Aries. Um, you know, there are a lot of licenses in British Columbia uh, that are already done using Aries. So uh, lawyer licenses, for instance, in British Columbia, you can get a digital credential uh, and you can prove that you're, you know, a legally licensed lawyer. Uh, and it's all built on top of Hyperledger Aries. Um, the British Columbia has also built uh, mining credentials, like not, not Bitcoin mining, like actual physical mining uh, on top of Aries. And, you know, um, ton, oh, I could go on for hours. Um, the, uh, there was a project with the uh, Aruba Tourism Authority on making travel credentials. Uh, so, you know, tourists could more quickly clear customs. And the developers really liked that one because they got to go to Aruba. Um, but yes, yeah, so it, it's being used all over the place and I expect it to continue to proliferate. And actually the Open Wallet project, uh, Open Wallet Foundation is also heavily involved in digital identity. Uh, and we expect the you know European standards uh, for digital identity and digital credentials to you know push this forward too. When you look at AIML, we can start hey the traditional uh, AIML, <laughs> and then we talk about generative AI. Uh, what kind of a scope do you see of generative AI or AI ML for the hyperledger? One of the things that uh, isn't really catching public attention right now, but is a really important problem, uh, is federated learning. So the idea is if you and I have, you know, suppose we're competitors, right? Uh, you know, or we're different hospitals and we have patient data and someone wants to run some learning algorithm or build some model on our data, right? But we can't share that data with each other, right? And, you know, there's no like single person we can easily give the data to, to perform that learning, right? So, so how do we do that, right? So what we can do is we can do federated learning and where we can learn off multiple different data sets uh, without anyone learning the individual or other, other people's data, right? Um, you know, this has applications in medicine and finance. You know, you can think of credit card fraud as something where you'd really like to have this, right? You know, if, if you're a credit card company and I'm a credit card company, we might work together to to combat fraud. Um, so if you want to do this, and if you want to do it, uh, you know, rapidly and, and continuously, like if we want to continually build our fraud models together, um, it's useful to have a, a consensus mechanism, uh, or some kind of consensus backbone or, or public message board so that I know you're not giving me, you know, bad messages. Or if you do, I, you know, I can prove that, you know, you, you did, uh, act maliciously. And so, you know, for a lot of these applications, a blockchain backbone is, is really excellent. Perfect. Uh, Hard, thank you so much for taking time out today Absolutely. and talk about this. And I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. No. Thank you very much for your time.